From the beginning, my relationship with my in-laws was strained. My husband, Jacob, suggested we keep our distance from them due to the ongoing tension. Although I was hesitant, believing it wasn't a permanent solution, Jacob consistently refused my suggestions to visit, claiming his mother, Anna, was unwell. Doubting his reasons, I decided to visit them unannounced and was shocked to find Jacob with an unknown woman and child. Anna, holding the stranger's child, pressured Jacob to leave me for her. This revelation led me to agree to a divorce, promising it would come at a significant cost to him. My name is Megan, and I've been married to Jacob, who is younger than me, for five years. From our first meeting, Jacob's parents, especially his mother Anna, made it clear they didn't approve of me. Anna's sharp comments hinted that she preferred a younger, more submissive wife for Jacob, contrasting sharply with my independent and career-focused demeanor. Despite their lack of support, I hoped time would soften our differences, and I made efforts to connect with them, like asking Anna to share her cottage pie recipe. Yet, Anna remained cold, criticizing my inability to perform traditional domestic tasks and insinuating that my career ambitions were a flaw. The situation worsened when I overheard Anna questioning Jacob about our plans for children, suggesting my age might be a barrier to having grandchildren. From then on, Anna blatantly ignored me, only speaking to Jacob and avoiding any interaction with me, which hurt more than her direct insults. This difficult dynamic underscored the challenges of navigating familial relationships, especially when faced with unwarranted hostility and expectations. Witnessing my unease, Jacob proposed a solution. Megan, maybe it's best if we take a break from visiting my parents. But don't you think Anna will miss our visits? He then suggested, I could visit them by myself. It might be easier for everyone. I realized Jacob had a point. Anna probably didn't enjoy my company much either. So Jacob started visiting his parents on his own during the weekends, leaving me at home. Yet, I felt this arrangement couldn't last forever. Jacob, I think it's time I tried to visit your parents again, I suggested one day. Jacob seemed worried by the idea, responding, You don't need to force yourself, but we can't avoid them forever. They are family. He then revealed with a serious tone, Actually, my mom's health isn't great lately. I worry that your presence might stress her out even more. I was taken aback, having been out of the loop about Anna's health condition for so long. The next Saturday, as Jacob left for his usual visit, my heart felt heavy with concern. Give my best to Anna, I said as he departed. Left alone, I pondered Anna's health, knowing she was advancing in age. Despite our strained relationship, the thought of avoiding her, particularly in a time she might need support, felt wrong. Determined to overcome the animosity, I decided to take a proactive step. I picked out some thoughtful gifts and set off for Jacob's parents' house, hoping to offer a gesture of goodwill. As I neared, the sound of laughter from the garden caught my attention. Curiously, I peeked through the foliage and saw Jacob, his father, an unfamiliar woman, and a baby, all enjoying a lighthearted moment together. Confused by the scene, I wondered about their identities. They appeared to be more than just distant relatives, given their intimacy. Then, Anna's voice broke through as she took the baby, calling herself Grandma. She then turned to Jacob, discussing the future, mentioning a woman named Eleanor as a better fit for him, and expressing her desire for more grandchildren from them. Eleanor's response was warm, hinting at a close relationship with Anna and a desire to integrate more fully into Jacob's life. Jacob, half-joking, suggested delaying a conversation about divorce with me, hinting that I might seek compensation. He felt unprepared for such a step. Anna, ever blunt, asked why he didn't just leave me, calling me a useless wife. Jacob acknowledged her frustration, explaining he was laying the groundwork for a divorce by painting a negative picture of me to his circle, describing me as a neglectful wife who never visited, couldn't cook, ignored household duties, and was irresponsible with money. He believed that if others saw him as the victim, it would justify the divorce. I was stunned upon overhearing their plan. Discovering Jacob's infidelity and his family's preference for his mistress over me fueled my anger. They were crafting a narrative to cast me as the antagonist in their story. But I was resolved not to let their deceit go unchallenged. Holding the gifts I had brought for Anna, my immediate thought was to collect proof of Jacob's affair. I considered hiring a detective to uncover the details of his relationship with his mistress. 
At home, I stopped performing my usual duties for Jacob. When he asked about dinner one evening, I casually handed him instant noodles, claiming I was too busy to cook. Though initially annoyed, he quickly dismissed it, which I realized played into his plan to depict me as negligent. Jacob's lack of complaints about the absence of home-cooked meals or unappruned shirts was a silent acknowledgement of his scheme. But this arrangement was exactly what I wanted. In a bold move, I checked his credit card statements and withdrew an amount I estimated he had spent on his mistress, confronting him with his own tactics. Jacob eventually addressed the unusual withdrawal, leading to a discussion about our finances. I played it off as routine spending, but Jacob smirking suggested we have a serious talk the following day at his parents' house, knowing well that it would be a more controlled environment for him. The next day, we visited his family home together for the first time in ages. His parents, forewarned by Jacob about the purpose of our visit, greeted me with feigned warmth. After brief pleasantries, Jacob wasted no time in presenting me with divorce papers, aiming to finalize the end of our marriage under his terms. Jacob declared he wanted a divorce, citing my recent behavior as the reason, my neglect of household duties and unexplained spending. Finding confusion, I questioned, what exactly are you tiered of? He listed my supposed faults from not cooking to misusing our funds. I met his accusations with silence, only to be met with his generous offer. He would not seek compensation if I agreed to the divorce quietly. That's when I made my stance clear. I agree to the divorce, but don't think I'll be misled about compensation. This caught Jacob and Anna off guard, their eyes locking briefly in surprise. They saw an opportunity in my demand for sincerity, quickly warming up to the idea of receiving compensation themselves. Then, as if on cue, the doorbell rang. I answered it, revealing a man ready to introduce himself as my lawyer, Mr. Gold, catching everyone by surprise. I saw this coming, so I hired him. If you're talking about compensation, we should know what's fair, I said, catching Jacob and Anna off guard. Mr. Gold wasted no time laying out the compensation I was entitled to due to Jacob's infidelity, $60,000. Jacob and Anna were visibly shaken, by the figure presented. Why are you handing this to me? Jacob blurted out, assuming I would be the one to pay. Mr. Gold corrected him. The compensation is to be paid by the party at fault, the one who cheated, which is you, Jacob. Jacob demanded to know on what grounds such a claim was made. Mr. Gold, armed with evidence from a private investigator, made it clear that the compensation was due to Jacob's betrayal. I confronted Jacob, you expect compensation for household chores I stopped doing because of your affair. Why should I cater to someone who's been unfaithful? Jacob, now cornered, pleaded his inability to pay such a sum, citing our dwindling savings, which he claimed were further depleted by the money I withdrew. Ironically, an amount equal to what he had spent on his affair. He argued that if I wanted the compensation, I should return what I took. Faced with the irrefutable evidence and the realization of his precarious financial situation, Jacob's defiance turned into submission. Jacob, in a bid to defend his actions, pleaded with me, claiming his affair had led to a child for whom he now needed to provide. Megan, I'm sorry about the affair, but there's a child involved. I can't afford to lose money because of this, he argued. I couldn't believe his audacity. You betray your wife and now talk about responsibility? Do you seriously plan to support this child? Jacob insisted. It was his duty as a father, suggesting I couldn't understand because I didn't have children. I countered. How can you commit to raising a child that might not even be yours? The timing of your affair and the age of the child don't seem to match. In a state of panic, Jacob summoned Eleanor to his family's house. She arrived full of entitlement, questioning Jacob about the finalization of our divorce. Caught off guard by my presence, she attempted to change the subject. Jacob, seeking confirmation, asked her directly if the child was indeed his, mentioning the child's name supposedly shared with his middle name. Eleanor, caught in the conversation, tried to reassure him while eyeing the divorce papers and the demand for compensation. You've told Megan? We're supposed to pay her compensation? And then you'll marry me? How much do we owe? $60,000, Jacob answered hopeful that paying the amount would allow them to start anew as a family. Eleanor's facade crumbled, revealing her true intentions. I'm out. You're broke because of this compensation, and the child should go to his real father. Confused, Jacob and I pressed her for the truth. Eleanor, with evident frustration, admitted the child wasn't Jacob's. 
She had been involved with someone else before Jacob and had turned to him thinking he was wealthier. Realizing her mistake, especially given Jacob's financial situation and the unwanted involvement with his family, she decided to leave. Both Jacob and his mother were left in shock by the revelation, their dreams of a family with Eleanor and the child shattered. Eleanor mocked their naivety and made to leave, but I stopped her. Wait, you're also responsible for this mess. I'll be seeking compensation from you as well. Eleanor was incredulous at the idea of compensating me. Why should I pay you? I didn't have Jacob's child, so it's fine, isn't it? She protested. But her involvement with a married man was grounds enough for her to face consequences. Frustrated and angry, Eleanor turned her ire towards Jacob, blaming him for her predicament. This mess is your fault, and now I'm dragged into it. Jacob defended himself, reminding Eleanor that she was well aware of his marital status when she chose to get involved. Anna, taking Jacob's seed, criticized Eleanor for attempting to trick Jacob into believing he was the father, calling her actions deceitful. Eleanor, unfazed by their accusations, retorted sharply, suggesting they should pay her for the illusion of having a grandchild. The house became a war zone of conflicting narratives and accusations. Exhausted by their behavior, I left the chaos behind, entrusting everything to my lawyer, Mr. Gold, and headed home. Once there, I changed the locks and sent Jacob's belongings to his family's house. I then called Jacob to inform him of my decisions, emphasizing there was no chance for reconciliation. Jacob, desperate, tried to salvage what was left of our relationship, claiming he had ended things with Eleanor and wanted to start over. But his pleas fell on deaf ears. You chose to cheat, Jacob. I can't be with someone who disrespects me like that, I stated firmly, making it clear that our marriage was over. I then hung up and blocked his number, cutting off any possibility of him reaching out to me. In the end, Jacob complied with the compensation demands, depleting his savings to the point where he struggled to find a new place to live. Eleanor, too, settled her part of the compensation with me. Free from the turmoil and now living peacefully in my own space, I eventually opened up to the possibility of a new beginning. Someone who genuinely cared for me entered my life, and I found myself contemplating remarriage, hopeful for a future filled with happiness and mutual respect.